Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. Today, we'll be talking with Janet DiCenzo, who's an expert in technology tools and universal design for learning. She will be sharing recommendations for the most popular and the most effective apps and extensions and tech tools, not only for students with attention and learning challenges in the classroom, but for all students. Her talk today will be geared for educators, for parents, for clinical professionals, and she'll discuss not only how to maximize students' learning through the use of apps and tools for Chromebooks and iPads and Windows and Macs, but also, in general, why educators are shifting the focus from accommodating students with disabilities to creating a more accessible and more engaging curriculum for all students. So, Janet, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. having you. You're always filled with interesting ideas. Um, <laughs> Let me introduce Janet to you listeners. Uh, She has been working in the field of assistive technology for more than 15 years. She started out actually, interestingly, assisting students with disabilities at the college level. And from there, she went on to start her own educational consulting company. And today, she's an assistive technology specialist in the Vernon Township School District in New Jersey, where she helps find technology solutions for students and assist teachers with integrating technology into all their lessons. So, Janet, again, thank you so much for coming. I want to thank our sponsor today, Time Timer. I think, you know, I don't know what parent of a child with ADHD or learning disabilities doesn't know Time Timer, but if you don't, you should. Um, Recommended by ADHD experts, Time Timer actually makes the passing of time visual with a disappearing disc. It's, It's available in all manner of formats, both digital and literal Um, on all major platforms, including Chromebook, Mac, PC, Android, iOS, with a digital watch. Um, You can learn much more at timetimer.com. So I really (laughs) urge you to check out Timetimer if you don't know it already. Okay, Janet, let me turn this over to you, and we look forward to hearing your... Okay. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you, folks from ADD Magazine, for having me back again. It's always uh, uh, really nice to to come in and speak with everyone and hear what your questions are. We are going to look at a couple of different areas, um, starting with how technology can help students that struggle with ADD and ADHD. the technology that are is being used in classrooms today, we have many different platforms. Um, we have many different types of tools, so we're going to look at that. Um, and finally, how technology fits into the UDL classroom. So we're going UDL uh, is what we call universal design for learning, and more and more we're seeing schools broaden their scope as far as accessibility uh, goes for students with uh, who are many different types of learners. So we want to make sure that. Um, what we're doing with our curriculum tools is accessible to all of our students, whether or not they have an ability or a disability or strength or a weakness. So we'll be talking about that. Okay. So before we begin, I just always like to make this personal disclaimer. I am not being asked by any manufacturer, not being um, asked to Uh, push any product, cover any product at all. This is all um, information for you that I've learned as a professional uh, working with students for many years now. So I'm not being um, reimbursed for any information here. Okay, so let's start with talking about schools and what type of technology programs we have in our schools. So In most schools, they're um, having to make a very difficult decision lately whether or not they should supply their students with a device or a type of device like a laptop or a Chromebook or an iPad. Um, And that can get very expensive for uh, schools. And then we have things to worry about like insurance policies and what happens if we, um, if a student breaks that device and how do we um, cover the cost of replacing them each year, um, as opposed to what we call a BYOD program, which stands for Bring Your Own Device. Um, and you would think that that would be uh, much easier for schools, 
but um, in essence, it really isn't because there are a lot of other things that need to be considered in a BYOD program, such as um, students bring devices that need to work with schools' filtering systems. They need to make sure that they have access to websites and browsers and tools that the school is going to be using as part of their curriculum. So there are pros and cons to both. Um, one of the, the pros uh, to using a BYOD program is that um, you as a family member get to control and decide what type of device your child will be using in school, which means you can also build in the tools um, and accessibility options that they might benefit from. The, the school does not control that. But on the other hand, the student needs to be really well versed in that device and know how to kind of fix it and manage it on the fly if things pop up in class or if it won't turn on or if it's, you know, not working properly because schools don't really have people to manage and to repair those devices. Um, it would just be too much. Um, in one-to-one -one programs, the school does supply the device, but then they are faced with um, issues like, do we allow those devices to go home each day? If not, do we have the carts and the space to store them in? Um, you know, are we going to choose one platform for the whole district? Is everybody going to get a Chromebook or do the younger kids get iPads and the older kids get Chromebooks? So, um, you, you know, there are a lot of important issues that go into making a decision like this. But one of the issues with a one-to-one -one program is if a student needs a tool or a specific accommodation tool, um, will the district be supportive in providing that tool? Um, so we have to make sure that what students have access to during the school day they will have access to for homework. So those are the things that we need to keep at the forefront as we're making these decisions about technology. So these are the four platforms that we'll be um, talking about today. Um, these are probably the most commonly used platforms. Um, Chromebooks have certainly um, taken over, I think, in certain parts of the country because of their cost and they're um, so easy to manage as far as the school district goes. Um, but, you know, there's, depending upon your district, um, it's depending upon your district and what they're willing to support and what their online curriculums look like, that has to all be taken into consideration with the tools that are being used with your students. Um, so as far as our talk today, the tools that I'll be covering and mentioning today are either um, free or what we call freemium. There's a free version available. There is a paid version available. So I will um, get into that as, um, as we go along. Okay, so one of the things we always come up against, and especially when we have um, students in middle school, seems to be a little bit more of an issue is... Um, you know, what about screen time? How much screen time are our kids getting in school? Um, you know, screens can really be an, a distraction to learning. Um, and how are the teachers monitoring what they're doing while they're on their, on their screens? Are they really paying attention? Are they really focusing on a learning activity? Or are they just randomly looking things up? Um, you know, there are a lot of tools that help teachers these days monitor what students are doing in the classroom. And as far as, you know, helping students to stay on task, we have tools that will lock uh, screens into a website. We have uh, management programs where a teacher can just look at her screen and see exactly what everybody's doing on their screens. They can lock student screens down. They can shut down websites. Um, and a question that we get a lot is, you know, do we really need to have computers in every one of our classrooms? Is it just, is it a requirement? And I wouldn't say we need them in every classroom, but I think that computers and devices and the internet in general bring learning experiences into the classroom that would not otherwise be um be available. You know, could we learn about, for instance, the three branches of government without a computer? Absolutely, we could. But how cool would it be if we could get onto Google Maps and take a tour inside the White House and really see the different areas um, that the president walks through and where the cabinet meets and the inside of the Capitol building? Now, it just brings a different um, 
level of engagement to your lessons. So um, it, that question comes up a lot. Do we really need my child to be on a computer in the classroom? And I say, you know what? It could make the lessons so much more engaging. It's just a matter of controlling the environment. Okay, so let's talk about the accessibility tools that we'll be looking at today. Now, some of the tools that we will look at are built into the OS, and OS means operating system. So if you are using a PC, that means that the operating system is Windows, and Microsoft has done a lot lately in adding accessibility to Windows. So we'll be looking at Chrome accessibility, we'll be looking at iPad accessibility, um, and hopefully we'll have time to get through all of those. In the past, we've had to purchase separate software and separate tools to help our students to gain accessibility. And now it's, it's becoming much more commonplace. Those tool, tools are available to everyone now. So some of the um, tools that we'll look at are um, freestanding programs um, that have the accessibility built into them. Others are specific to apps that need to be installed. And then yet others are add-ons that can be added to the browser, such as the Chrome browser. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to start with, because this we are focusing on um, students who struggle with attention issues and learning issues, is we need to keep them on task. So here's where um, that whole BYOD versus one-to-one -one come into play, because some of the productivity tools are really meant to be um, managed and used by the individual and not turned on and managed by, say, the teacher or the IT department. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Pomodoro technique, um, the Pomodoro technique um, reinforces that we should be setting a certain amount of time that we should expect to stay on task. And normally for adults, that's 25 minutes. So we would work for 25 minutes, lock ourselves into the task, and then go ahead and take a break for five minutes. So 25 minutes is a long time for most young students. Um, I would say you need to scale that down based on the students' abilities and their attention issues. Um, but here are some programs that actually help you to do that with the screens. So for Windows, there is a program that can be installed on a Windows machine called Cold Turkey Blocker. And what these programs do is they allow you to lock yourself either into a website or websites so that you can't go out and, you know, waste time on Twitter or waste time on Facebook or those other websites like Minecraft or Fortnite or things that um, students get caught up in and then they get pulled off task. These type of tools can be used really by anyone. And actually, I use strict workflow myself when I know I have to get things done and not kind of wander off and, and get into the rabbit hole of, of the internet. Um, so there are benefits to certain ones. Windows and Mac actually are can be kind of dangerous because if you set them to lock you into certain websites, you cannot get out of those websites or certain programs even. Um, you can shut down your computer. Uh, Self-control for Mac even says that you can uninstall it from your computer and it will still keep your computer locked until the timer is up. So, um, you really have to take these into consideration with the type of student you're using them with uh, because some students will do anything to try and get out of that timer um, and wouldn't have the patience for it. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, as far as the Chromebook extensions go, um, those are effective when you're using the Chrome browser. However, if you are on a PC and you can use a browser other than Chrome, then you can just bypass those timers and use a different browser. So, um, you know, that may not be as effective, those, those Chrome extensions. As far as the iOS uh, tools go, those are now built directly into the iPad. And the new settings in iOS 12, which have... Um, just coming out, allow you to control screen time. They allow you to um, lock a screen into a certain app, but they also will control the amount of time you are on, on the iPad. So those are more um, parental controls. Um, okay. 
So we're going to move on. Sorry about the announcements in the background, folks. I forgot about the Pledge of Allegiance for afternoon kiddos. Um, okay, so the next thing that's really important for our students is good organization tools. Um, I am a huge believer in everything in its place um, to help us to tr try and stay organized. I know we've got a lot of kids who go home and things fall into the black hole of the backpack and they are never to be seen again. So I'm a huge believer in note keepers. I'm a huge believer in um, in uh cloud storage. So let's talk about the note takers that are available for our students. So the first thing um, we will look at are browser-based notes and those types of notes um, that are uh, shared and not only stored, but shared between students or teachers and students or students and students. So uh, Microsoft has a great online note taker. It's called OneNote. It is free. There is a OneNote.com uh, for free. You can create a Microsoft account um, that is uh, more limited than if you were to have a subscription and install it on your computer. But uh, OneNote is a tool that I love for school. Um, it allows you to create notebooks, and within those notebooks, you have tabs so that you can have, in essence, a three-subject notebook or a two-subject notebook. Um, you'll see that the ribbon up here at the top, your toolbar, it looks just like what students have seen before in Microsoft Word. They can insert PDF files. They can insert pictures. They can actually draw on their notes if they're using it with a tablet or a Surface tablet. So, And all of that is stored automatically um, in the cloud. So it's what we call device agnostic. Um, those tools do not require you to have a specific device in order to access your notes, which is great because if you, you know, you leave your device at school or, you know, you go to grandma's house and you need to do homework and it's in your notes, you can just log into onenote.com and use any device. So that's our Microsoft version. Okay, um, the next one we'll, we'll look at very quickly is Google Keep. And Google Keep is not one of those um, greater known tools. A lot of people don't really know about Google Keep. It's one of the apps that came out kind of after Google Docs and after Google Drive. Um, but I love Google Keep. I have Google Keep as an app on my phone. I also have it um, in my Chromebook. And Google Keep is kind of like a neat um I call it post-it notes on steroids. So you can take notes and if your notes start to get too long, you can actually export that note into a Google Doc and continue to develop those thoughts or you can keep them right here in, in Keep. Um, your notes can be tagged so that you can organize them and sort them. You can color code them. You can add uh, reminders so that... Um, if you have something that's um, date sensitive, you can put a date on it. Uh, but Google Keep is is something that I highly recommend. Again, device agnostic. For those of you who are iPhone users or iPad users, you um, know all about the Notes app on there. Uh, it integrates with all of your Apple devices through iCloud. Um, and it also, again, allows you to do sketching, typing. Um, you can add pictures to it. Your camera will integrate with it. And again, you can have it available on your Mac or on your iPhone or on your iPad. Okay, so as I mentioned before, along with our files is our um, our notes, rather, is our file storage. So um, for those of you who work in schools or have kids, you probably recognize those big zipper binders. Um, when my son was in middle school, we used to do what was called a binder dump because somehow the papers never got into the right folders. So those binders sometimes get a little bit crowded and disorganized. Um, so as far as organizing ourselves digitally, I'm a huge believer in cloud storage. So as you'll, as you probably already know, there's a bunch of different options um, for students to be storing their documents. But again, 
they need to be organized. So just as you can be disorganized in a binder, you can be disorganized in your digital cloud storage. So if you look closely at this, this is a screenshot of Google Drive. And this is one of the things we teach our students to start off the year with folders that are color coded um, and everything goes into the right folder. So we have a language arts folder, we have a math folder. And again, with cloud storage, just like Google Drive, you can save any types of files, not just Google Docs in these folders. So if a teacher shares a PDF file with you, it can go into the file. If a student is um, taking pictures or video with their Chromebook, those can be stole, stored into the folder for the right class. Um, and I always recommend that students open up the folder and start their new doc or their new presentation from inside the folder so that once they close it down, it will be stored in the right place, as opposed to just clicking on the new button, starting a new document, and then just having to move it sometime later on into the right folder, because we know very often we end up with a pile of files at the bottom of the folders and they never get placed into the right folder. So. Moving on, aside from uh, our Google Drive, we have uh, a couple of different options for online storage. Google allows students um, in schools who are what we call G Suite school districts, unlimited storage. So students can save pictures and video and anything pretty much that they could uh, create in school and share and save it into their Google Drive. Um, again, unlimited. At the end of their school time, when they graduate from high school, those files can be exported out so that the students become the sole owners of those, those files into their personal Google accounts. Uh, Microsoft's version of online storage is what we call OneDrive. Uh, OneDrive integrates really nicely with Office Online. Um, many of our school districts are using Office 365, which again has um, further tools for accessibility built into them. And that is available for use on just about any device and browser. Um, the storage for uh, school users and school districts depends upon the plan that the IT department has purchased or that the district has purchased. Um, they start out with five gig for personal plans if you don't want to uh, purchase storage for a personal account. Um, but I have yet to hear of any student or teacher that runs out of storage space if they are using OneDrive at school. The other great thing that I want to talk about with Google Drive and OneDrive is it allows for real-time collaboration. So um, students can share files, they can open files, and they can work at them at the same time, which is a really nice feature. Uh, Dropbox is another common type of cloud storage. Um, I don't know of many districts that purchase Dropbox for their district, but it is available to students if they want to have their own personal account. Um, the free accounts start at two gig and they go up from there. They are not built into any particular suite of tools, but it is available on just about any device. Um, there, are, there are Dropbox um apps that integrate with cameras and with other um, writing tools so that you can save your files right into Dropbox. So now that we've talked about organization, uh, let's talk about what happens when the real work begins. So one of our biggest challenges with our students with attention issues is writing is very difficult. Writing takes a huge amount of concentration. And for some students, they have great ideas in their heads, but actually putting pen to paper can be a huge challenge. So um, one of the tools that we see used a lot with our students with attention issues is our dictation tools. Um, and for many of our students using Chromebooks, uh, this is built right into uh, Google Docs now and Google Slides. So if you've ever used Google Docs, you know that you have a pull down menu that's marked tools. And when you click on tools, you will see voice typing about halfway down the menu. Um, some people say, yeah, but don't you need a special microphone? Don't you need a headset mic? Um, the answer to that is no. The Chromebook mics are surprisingly good and uh, our students use them all the time. Um, now, the other question is, well, then you have a whole room of kids talking at once um, and how do they concentrate? Well, if 
you know, you have a flexible classroom uh, where the teacher says, work where you are comfortable. Uh, there are classrooms that I walk into and there are kids sitting all over the floors. They're sitting at cafe tables. They're sitting in beanbag chairs with their Chromebooks and they're speaking into them and concentrating and getting their their thoughts down onto the screen. Um, other students are, now if you need to to type outside of Google Docs and you're using a Chromebook, there is an extension. Um, and again, there are many extensions. I, I am picking choosing some of my favorites and I'm sure you all have your favorites out there too, but, and they're changing all the time. But one of my favorites is a, an extension called Voice In. And this is an extension that you would add on to Chrome and once you activate it, you speak into your microphone um, as you would normally speak and your words will show up. I use this for Gmail all the time. I use it at, in our um, in our school district's uh, learning management system to put uh, messages out there to teachers. It's pretty accurate. Okay, so in iOS, um, Apple did this a, a long time ago on the iPhone. They added this little microphone button to their keyboard. So just about any app that you need to type into on an iPad or on your iPhone uh, will take voice recognition. So if you don't want to type on those little tiny keys, click on that little microphone button and speak into your device and it will type for you. This is probably one of the best known voice recognition tools. Microsoft has also broadened um, their accessibility tools and they um, built a dictate button right into Office 365. I want to give a quick shout out to Dr. Brian Friedlander who helped me out with these because you know you can't have a subscription to every tool and every device so um, right now I don't have a subscription to Office 365 so he was kind enough to help me out with these screenshots. Um, as you see on the bottom, that is an add-on. You'll see that dictation menu button in that uh, red square there. That is an add-on for Word um, and PowerPoint and Outlook so that anytime you want to dictate into the desktop versions of those programs, you click that dictate button and you speak right into the built-in microphone on your laptop. Uh, the, the tool on the top is what it looks like in Office 365, this dictate option is built into your home screen so that you, again, if you have to type a paper in Word, you can dictate it. Um, and finally, on Mac, uh, if you have a, a MacBook at home, Mac has some of the best and most accurate uh, dictation tools on the market. I have to say that I think Chrome and Mac, uh, Chromebooks and MacBooks run a pretty close uh, tie for first place because they're um, dictation is, is very, very accurate without having to go in and train any of the tools. It used to be that uh, you had to uh, read for about 40 minutes and train that software to know your voice and to know how you pronounce words. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, and Mac did that pretty quickly and pretty accurately. So their dictation continues to be um, excellent quality. And if you are using a MacBook, you can set this up in your keyboard settings in your user preferences um, and turn on uh, dictation using hotkeys. So by default, I believe it's function. If you hit the function key twice on your MacBook, you can start to dictate into your microphone and it will type for you. So try that out if you have a MacBook. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is reading. And again, reading is something that takes a lot of concentration. Sometimes students need complete silence. Other students need to have the TV on. They need to have music on. Um, you know, to help with their concentration or they need some kind of white no noise. Um, I know myself when I have to read for a very long time in a textbook or, uh, you know, something that, that I need to do a report on, I have trouble concentrating for long periods of time. And that's when I turn on my text-to-speech. So text-to-speech is available through just about any device now. Again, this was one of those tools that we had to purchase software separately and it was very expensive, but we've come a long way. And now text-to-speech is built into just about any device uh, students use. Um, so 
in, in, uh, on our Chromebooks, um, one thing I did not make a screenshot of is Google has now built text to speech into the Chromebook operating system. And, um, it allows you to select a certain amount of text and then have it speak out loud. Uh, the voices have gotten much better. They've really improved. Google has their own set of voices to choose from. Um, but that is now built into the operating system called Select and Speak. You would go into the accessibility tools. Chromebook also has something called Chrome Vox, and that's more of a screen reader um, for folks who are visually impaired, but it is, it does give you the ability to listen to text written out loud, uh, text written on your screen, um, but it will read just about everything on your screen. Um, but it is available for those who need everything read. Um, finally, there are certain Chrome extensions that may have more options available to you. For example, um, one of the most important features of text-to-speech is the reading speed. If you have a TTS tool that's reading too quickly, um, it almost makes matters worse because now you're trying to read on your own with your eyes and you're filtering out what you're hearing with your ears because you're not able to process both at the same time. So you really need to be able to control the reading speed. Uh, you need to be able to find a voice that's got the proper pitch. Do you need a high pitch? or do you process lower tones better? Um, and these types of tools, the extensions um, have different options. These are just three of my favorites. There are many, many out there. Um, so the first one on the top, that long bar is Read and Write for Google Chrome. This is one of those tools that is free for everybody, but there is a paid version that allows you some of the more um, sophisticated tools, um, but the, the text-to-speech component is free for all. Um, Read Aloud and Speak It are available to you through the uh, web store in the Chrome web store, and you can install those onto your web browser and use them on a PC, on a, uh, a Mac running Chrome, or on your Chromebook. As far as um, iOS goes, we have had the ability to um, speak a selection for quite some time now. This is something that Mac built into their operating systems. So what you would do is go into your settings on your phone or on your iPad, and you would look for accessibility under general. And then you would look for speak selection or speak screen. So for those of you who are reading books on your iPad, that's a lot of um, text to have to select. So if you have full pages of text, instead of selecting it first and then hitting read, you have the ability to do what's called a two-finger swipe. And when you do a two-finger swipe, it will read from the top to the bottom of the page and then continue to read. Um, speak selection means you have to select a certain amount of text first before it starts reading. Um, as far as the Mac goes, again, uh, Mac has built text-to-speech into their operating system. This is not an add-on to their browser, um, but it, it allows you to go into the accessibility options um, in your system preferences and go to the speech area and um, choose a, a hotkey. Again, you would select the text and then um, use the hotkey to have it read. Right now, the default setting is option space, and that will read what you've selected. Um, Microsoft has, has got quite a few tools that they've built into their Microsoft suite. One of them is, uh, and one of the newer ones is what we call the immersive reader. And this actually takes information that's in a, a Word document um, and allows you to in, have a, a more friendly reader user um, screen and will read that text out loud to you. It spaces the text apart a little bit so that it's um, easier to track that text and it reads the text aloud. Um, so that's called the immersive reader and that is under the view pull down menu. I'm sorry, this is for online tools only. If you're using the desktop version of Microsoft Word, you may or may not have noticed that you have a ribbon at the very top of your screen. This is at the very, very top left side of your screen that you can customize so that you have tools 
instantly available to you. And one of them is the select and speak tool. So if you've never noticed before, there's this little tiny down arrow at the um, end of those that tool list, and that will allow you to customize the tools that show up here. Um, if you click on that arrow, go into all tools, um, a customize, and then look at all tools, and then look for the speak option, and it will give you that little speak bubble there. So same rules apply. You select your text, and you click that button, and it will read out loud. Um, once again, uh, Microsoft has uh, new tools built into Word for desktop. Um, if you go to the view pull down menu um, in the learning tools, there's also the ability to change the view of, of your text as it's reading aloud. So it will put um, dots in between syllables. It will change the column width. It will change the spacing between the letters so that it's a little bit easier to track and read. Um, and again, you have your read aloud options here. So they've really done a lot for students who struggle with reading. Okay, so those are some of your more commonly known tools. And then I've just decided to put in a, a bit of a smattering of, of tools that have been really helpful for certain uh, learners in our schools. One of my, or I should say two of my very favorite extensions for Chrome, and, and I, you know, tend to to be Chrome-centric sometimes because I do work in a uh, Chromebook district, um, are these two tools here. So for those of you who do a lot of reading online, if you look at newspapers online, if you look at magazines online, you know that there are screens that have a lot of clutter on them. They have a lot of little side text boxes or um, captioned pictures, things like that. Those are the types of things that could really um, be overwhelming for a learner uh, or be very distracting for a reader. What Mercury Reader does is if you were to open up, let's say, an article from the New York Times or from the Scholastic Reader and you click the Mercury Reader Chrome extension, it takes that website and it finds the main article and it strips everything else out from that page so that you're just focusing on the article. It will show you any pictures related to that article, but it spaces out the, the lines of text so that it's easier to read and there are no side captions or text boxes or columns. Um, so that's a, it gives you a really nice clean page to read. Beeline Reader is very similar, but um, what it does is it adds a gradient color to every line of text. So each line of text will start with one color and kind of um, change or morph into a different color by the end of that line. And then the next line will start with the completely different color. And again, the thought process is to help with those students who have difficulty tracking uh, lines of text. It kind of really pulls your eye along. Um, it also does uh, what Mercury Reader does. It kind of strips out all the distraction from a website so that it helps you to focus on the article that you're trying to read. Um, it also includes the open dyslexic font. So if you have a student who prefers to read using the open dyslexic font, you can change the font of the article into uh, open dyslexic. So two very highly recommended tools for our students. Um, two more are what we call um, tools that can um, help with reading comprehension. So Rewordify is a website that allows you to take, uh, let's say you have a very long article to read. You can just select that article, all the text in that article, and paste it into Rewordify. And what that does is it brings down the reading level and it eases the, um, the complexity of the sentence structure so that the vocabulary is easy to, easier to read, the sentence structure is easier, um, it breaks down very long sentences um, to help with comprehension. Um, so it's it could be a, a a huge help for students that are overwhelmed with a lot of reading and difficult reading. 
And then finally, Learning Ally, again, one of my favorite tools. This is an online book library for students who struggle with reading. Uh, you do need to qualify to be eligible to use their books, uh, but many of our students here at school uh, qualify for Learning Ally books. Um, our, our district does pay for Learning Ally, but I will say that it's worth every penny. Um, so books that students are reading together as a class can be downloaded onto a device and uh, listened to. And most of the books now are read by a human reader, not by a, a synthesized speech voice. Um, so it's a, it's a really great tool. And then finally, I just want to talk very quickly about the UDL classroom environment. Um, more and more, our teachers are looking to make our classrooms uh, more of a comfortable learning environment. So the sitting in rows, I think, um, of the past and being quiet and still for 40 to 45 minutes or 50 minutes um, is not something we're seeing too much uh, in this day and age. And that's a good thing. We, you know, sometimes learning needs to be messy and our students need to move. So um, in many of our classrooms now, we have standing desks in the back of the room. So, you know, if a student really needs to get up and move around in order to concentrate, uh, they can get up and stand at the standing desk with their, um, their device and their books and their notebooks. Um, over on the left-hand side here, I have what I call wiggle cushion cushions um, that are, you know, really allow a student to kind of rock in their seat and um, be a little bit more comfortable as opposed to sitting in those hard chairs all day. They allow you to move. Uh, and we have our, our bands that go down at the bottom of our chairs so that we can move our feet while we're sitting in them. And again, we have uh, the time timer here on the corner. Many of you are familiar with time timer, um, one of our sponsors here that give you a, a visual representation of how much time you have to work uh, on, on a project or on a task. So the, the classroom environment um, really has a lot to do with whether or not a student's going to be able to focus, to work, and to stay on task. So we're not just talking about screens and the type of instruction instruction going on. We're talking about the environment, the tools that are um, available to students who need to move around a little bit. Um, I'll just end by a quick story. One of the things that um, my son said to me uh, in high school when he was really struggling, you know, my son was diagnosed with ADD when he was in first grade. And, uh, you know, when he was really doing poorly in high school, he said to me, mom, one of the worst things that I need to do and to think about is how I'm going to sit at my desk for the next 45 minutes. And I really don't have room in my brain to think about anything else for 45 minutes, but how am I going to stay in this chair and not get hurt and not wow. get in trouble? So that to me spoke volumes. And, you know, that's when I asked the teacher to make a, a circle and masking tape on the floor and say, you know what, we don't have a place for him to stand, but as long as he's standing at his desk and staying in that circle and he's working, you know, we can't expect him to sit for 45 minutes. So that always stayed in my mind when I think about the environment. Um, and I'll end on that note. So, okay. yeah, thank you. That was, um, that's a poignant story, statement on his, <laughs> his part. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, some inter lots of interesting questions here. What, just backing up for a second, um, you mentioned the dyslexic font. Mm -hmm. And there oh. are listeners who are not, under, do not know what that is and would okay. love to hear more about that. So there's a font that was developed. Um, it's called the Open Dyslexic Font. And the font uh, style is um, what they call um, bottom heavy. So it's weighted uh, to be a little bit thicker um, on the baseline of the font so that um, there's been a lot of studies uh, about the effectiveness of, and the ability to, to read for those students who um, are dyslexic. And this font uh, is supposedly helpful for those students. Um, it's a little bit controversial, uh, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if it's going to help you with your reading, then let's use it. Um, and that's a font that is available through that um, Beeline Reader. Mm, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. On the topic of writing, um, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recommendations to help uh, kids who have a, have difficulty writing? There are two questions related to that. In one case, 
um, just a question about writing mechanics. And mm-hmm. then in another case, the writer, the this, the uh, person who's asking the question, son has been given accommodations to use a word processor for written assignments. But when it comes to math, his mm-hmm. writing is so poor that it's difficult for him to line up the words correctly. Yes. And then yeah. he therefore make. So they're w- wondering, again, on the mechanics of writing, um, what you might advise both in terms of writing and in terms of math. Yeah. R- writing is, is a challenge. I've, I've never seen so many students who have, um, poor pencil, um, grasp as I have lately. Um, it's, mm. it's interesting the way some kids hold a pencil. Um, and there are special pens that, you know, pens and pencils that, you know, you have your rubber pencil grips. Everybody's seen those, but I remember seeing a pen that's actually got, a loop in it that you have to put your finger through in order to hold it. So, um, you know, let's think about what they're using to actually do that writing. The other thing I would say, especially when it comes to math is let's take the paper and turn it sideways. Let's take your, your lined paper, your loose leaf paper, turn it sideways Mm -hmm. and use the lines up and down so that that's how our students hold our, our math problems in, um, lining things up properly, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, whatever it takes to use, you know, to keep things organized. You can't do math if you can't read your your numbers and and your decimals. Um, So always turn the paper sideways. And the other thing that I've seen used is um, weighted lined paper. So there's paper out there and it's, I'm not going to say that it's cheap, but it's out there um, that in addition to there being, you know, the, the regular blue lined paper, the, the ruled paper, those lines are actually somewhat raised so that there's a a tactile feel to that paper. So when you hit that line while you're writing, you know, you know, this is where I, I go back up and make my circle to make my B or my P. Um, so that kind of, you know, you start real small and you get real big writing, you know, I, I call it, um, tower writing. It looks like mm-hmm. the, you know, you're writing in, in building towers and you're building the size of your writing. Well, that kind of discourages that because your pencil kind of hits that bump and it keeps you in line of, of how big your letters are supposed to be. It works great for math if you turn it sideways too. A number of people are chiming in on that and saying they use graph paper and graph yep. paper really helps. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And you can print graph paper with all different sizes for free off of the internet. So it's not like you have to go out and graph paper. You have to find the graph paper with the boxes that are the right size for your student. Because if they're too small, it's not going to make any difference. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting question. Um, This is a teacher who says, I work with students in many schools who use Google Docs. Mm -hmm. And the teachers seem to train the students to open the docs rather than (laughs) <laughs> explaining to them what their drive is. And she says, I mean, this I understand this completely. I haven't found a way to help them keep their files organized within their drive. What am I right. missing? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's, yeah. a, it's a really, really good point. And, it and is. Yeah. what I try to do is our students start with their Chromebooks. You know, they start writing in third grade with their Chromebooks, but in fourth grade is where they start carrying them around and using them for everything. I try to push into every class and tell the kids, you are not allowed to go to Google Docs anymore. And they look at me like a deer in the headlights. Like, what are you talking about, lady? You've been telling us to use Google Docs. You don't ever start in Google Docs. You always start in Google Drive. And not only do you start in Google Drive, but you start in the folder in Google Drive so that when you close that doc and you're finished writing, you don't have to remember to move it. Um, I ch- try to encourage students every year to start the new school year by archiving all their old stuff and putting it into a folder called archived with the school year date on it, and then making all new folders for that school year. Because yes, their Google drives. I think one little boy said to me, Mrs. DiCenzo, it looks like somebody threw up in my Google drive because there's everything. And I just, I thought that was the funniest comment. I mean, you know, fifth graders have a great sense of humor, but yeah, it, everything is all over the place. And, and let's talk about the untitled documents, you know, that none of them have names. Um, They're all called untitled and and that doesn't help a student with organizational issues. So yes, always start in inside Google Drive. Tell students don't go to Google Docs or don't go to Google Slides. 
That's really interesting. Yeah, because your Google Drive can be just a complete as much as a, of a mess as your as your desk could be right. paper, right? Yeah. Right. Um, a, a recommendation from Mark for something called Equatio for math. Yes. Yes. Equatio is yeah, amazing. Yeah. What is it? So, so Equatio is an add-on to um, Read and Write for Google Drive, and it, it is a math tool that allows students to speak into a microphone, and it will actually write out your math equations for you. So um, math can be really difficult for students with fine motor and dexterity issues. If you don't get those symbols right, or if you don't get the numbers on the right side of the fraction bar, um, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. So you really need to, um, you know, find a great tool for math. Math's always been a challenge. And Equatio, um, if you look it up, it is an add-on for the read and write toolbar. Um, not sure if it's free or pricing or anything like that, but do a little bit of research and see if you can get it for free. I'm not sure how that works now. Okay. Equatio, for those, someone who asks, is, I think E-Q-U-A-T-I-O. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, here's an interesting question from someone who asks, you know, is using an app doing voice dictation going to <laughs> negatively impede learning to write? Or how do you balance learning how to write with using an app? Yeah. So it's kind of a philosophical question, but I'm sure it comes up frequently. It comes up all the time. You know, the right. whole idea of, are we giving our students a crutch? Right. Um, and I get that. I, I so get that. Um, and the same works for the text-to-speech. Okay, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I'll give you my personal philosophy, and everybody has their own philosophy about this. Um, in grades up to third grade, we, the focus is really learning how to read and learning how to write. Once we get past third grade, if your student starts to fall behind, that gap starts to grow. So if we're not doing anything to fill that gap, if we're not doing anything to remediate that reading and remediate that writing, um, or, or maybe we are, but we're still expecting students to keep up with the content of what they're learning uh, without giving them some type of tools, then that gap is just going to continue to grow. So remediate when we should. Um, focus on, you know, if, if part of the pro the project is, or part of the objective of the lesson is handwriting or typing, um, then certainly they shouldn't be using any type of voice recognition. But if, you know, our students are, let's say there's the, the goal of the lesson is to learn about something in our science chapter. Well, they're not going to learn if they don't have some type of tool. Yes, we want them to apply those strategies that they are learning in their remediation classes in their Wilson reading or their Orton Gillingham, but we don't want them to also fall short in their learning because of their shortcomings. So allow them the tools and, and that is part of the, the UDL framework, the universal design framework is give them the tools they need to reach the objective, to reach the goal of that lesson. Um, remediate, continue to remediate, but also give them the tools that they need to be able to fulfill the, the goal of the lesson. If it, and if that is writing a paper about the content, then the content is what matters more than whether or not I right. have the ability to type it. I mean, I think the same question comes up with for dyslexic, right? Dyslexic, mm -hmm. right? Where listening to books on tape, in fact, makes it makes, I think this is, is this correct? It Ma makes, makes it more likely that their language skills won't fall behind while they learn phonics and learn to read. Right. The same I, yeah. 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 I mean, at, at what point, concern, right. it is a concern. And, and, and again, we are going to continue to remediate, but at, you know, at no point would we ever ask somebody in a wheelchair, you know, eventually you're going to need to run that mile in gym. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, if if the student is truly dyslexic or the truly truly learning disabled, um, then we we have to give them the tools to succeed. But yes, continue mm -hmm. to encourage them. But, you know, let's not be mean here. Let's let's right, give them right. the tools to succeed. 
Um, question, interesting question. What's your best recommendation for students who can't listen and take notes simultaneously? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty it's, common too, right? It's another huge uh, issue. Yes, there are a lot of students who have difficulty with note taking. Um, I just talked to a whole group of fifth grade teachers about this. Um, there is a tool that is one of my favorites. It's called the LiveScribe Pen. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, the LiveScribe Pen actually has a camera in it and a microphone. So you use a special notebook paper or you can print the paper out yourself. And as you're writing, it is listening and mapping what you're writing to the audio that's being spoken, that's being recorded. So I can draw a star on my paper while I'm listening to the lecture. And then later on that night, take that pen, touch it to the ink and listen to exactly what my teacher was saying. Um, that was important for me to know. Um, note taking is an extremely complex skill. I don't know if everybody really realizes all that is involved with that. Um, but um, we really need to teach our students not how to copy off the board, but to pull out keywords um, and key phrases and learn how to bullet because the art, you know, note taking is really an art form and, and we just expect our students to know how to do it. It doesn't work that way. So um, if, if we do have um, teachers who do not want to be recorded, uh, I'll, very often what they'll do is use something called guided note taking. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll kind of start the notes for the students so that there are keywords already on there. And they, as they continue to teach, they will pause and allow the student to fill in those spaces of those guided notes so that they are not completely on their own. Um, but again, that's, you know, that's another strategy that a teacher right. could use. Mm -hmm. um, someone mentions on the live scribe pen that she struggles with equity issues because it's so expensive. It, and, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's wondering if there are any districts that provide this as an accommodation. It's hard to imagine. Um, I have, yeah. I have a few districts who I know who really have supplied that, you know, but the other issue that goes along with the live scribe pen is it's something you have to carry around, which means it's something that can get lost. Right. So and it's expensive, right? Yeah. 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 Um, do you have any recommendations for programs to help kids learn how to type? Oh, so many recommendations. <laughs> um, you know, again, this is something else that's controversial. Someone said to me, why are we teaching our kids how to type when everything they're going to do is going to be dictation? Well, because there's still things like park tests and they're going to have to type. So let's let's be real. We have to type. Um, there are free tools online. There's, um, oh, there's so many. If you just Google um, keyboarding exercises, um, or keyboarding lessons. There, there used to be something called dance math typing. There, you know, Mavis Beacon was around years and years ago. I think they're still around. Um, but there are other um, typing programs that are more, you know, start with the home row and then kind of progress on. I think there's a there's typing club. There's typing agent. There's um, there's just typing.com. There's tons of different websites out there for learning so how to type. No specific, no specific. No, I don't have a specific one. Here's the thing okay. about typing, folks. If you're not going to cover up the keyboard in any way and allow a student to see the keyboard in another place other than where they're putting their fingers, they're never going to learn how to touch type. It's something that takes tons mm -hmm. and tons of practice and repetition. So unless those keyboards are covered up in some way, I've seen um, typing teachers use boxer shorts. Everybody bring in a pair of boxer shorts and you <laughs> kind of strap it around the keyboard and you put a hand up each each leg and, um, you know, that's they got a feel for those home keys and that's how they teach keyboarding. But um, yeah, it's, it's muscle memory. They just have to practice. Right. Yeah, so much practice. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many good questions here. I wish we had twice as much time. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate your coming today. And thank you, Janet, so much. Oh, okay. Thank you for Bye. having Bye. me. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. Whether you're looking to build a website for your business, your hobby, your podcast, or just for fun, Pair Networks is your go-to web hosting partner. Not only do we have the lowest domain price in the industry, starting at just 11 bucks, we've got hundreds of stunning website templates to help you stand out from the crowd. 
You're not a techie? Not a problem. With our easy DIY site builders, you can launch your impressive website without any technical know-how. And when it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. P-A-I-R dot com.